You're listening to The Thrive Podcast, where every week we dive into a practical, tactical tip to bring you from a life of simply surviving to thriving. It's personal development for the everyday girl who is done with coasting through her days, done with feeling like she's missing out on the deeper meaning of her own life, and done with mediocrity once and for all. Because it's not enough to simply survive, you deserve to thrive. Welcome back to Thrive. Anyone who has experienced birth trauma knows it to be, well, traumatic. It's Birth Trauma Awareness Week, and not one but two members of Team Thrive have experienced traumatic births. We're welcoming Katie behind the mic today to share her birth story and her journey towards healing and thriving after experiencing a totally life-changing traumatic event. In this episode, we break down the narrative around birth, share helpful things we've both learned through therapy, and shed light on the ongoing transition of what thriving really means after trauma. We also pass along some advice, friend to friend, in case you've got girlfriends or sisters in crisis who need your support and you're not quite sure where to start. Stay tuned through this conversation. Drop it five stars if you like what you're listening to. And now, welcome Katie. All right. Welcome back to Thrive here with my girl, Katie. (laughs) Normally, uh, you guys know Katie, I think by now, if you don't, she's my fabulous assistant who helps with literally every aspect of Thrive. So the show would not be here without her. And we had the uh, brilliant, but maybe not so brilliant. We're really going to find out in real time here how this goes. um, Idea to do an episode on thriving after birth trauma. Whoa, heavy. Uh, because we've both experienced birth trauma and at this point we're both what three and two and a half ish, one and a half. 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 Oh yeah. He's not (laughs) all Henry. We're like a little bit removed from the situation and have both undergone, uh, extensive therapy (laughs) in our own healing journeys. And we thought, you know, this would be potentially a really helpful episode, hopefully for any of you listening who might've also experienced birth trauma or might know somebody who had a less than ideal, I guess we could say birth experience, not necessarily what you like journal ahead of time with Mm -hmm. my birth plan, my, how I hope it'll go, (laughs) how those, how Pinterest tells you it should go. So, um, I think we're just going to hop right into it and spill the tea. (laughs) If you want to call it that on what we actually went through and then, um, the journey that has evolved in the time since. So Katie, do you want to kick us off with Tell us all about your birth trauma. My, I think I feel like I need to give a caveat that like sometimes I laugh or joke when something is like really oh, I, hard. I have a morbid sense of humor. Yeah, totally. So like when we're laughing here, it's please trust that it's because we've been through a lot, been through a lot of healing, and it was like the way to cope through yeah. really hard things. We don't think it's actually funny. <laughs> okay, so I had Henry a year and a half ago, so September twenty twenty. First traumatic experience, I guess you could say, is the being pregnant for the first time, you know, in the middle of a global pandemic was was super fun (laughs) Um, and trying to navigate all the unknowns of everything that was going on and how life would look and how life would be after I had my son. So yeah, that in and of itself was kind of traumatic. (laughs) So right before I had Henry, I had actually, I had high blood pressure throughout my pregnancy, but they thought it was just, okay, maybe that's just your norm. Um, Eventually they did put me on baby aspirin to start treating that. And they just monitored me super, super well. Um, I was monitoring my blood pressure at home at one point because I kept having high numbers. And over, I think it was like Labor Day weekend or the weekend after Labor Day, I had gotten some some pretty high readings, like 150 over 100, which is, which is high. Your normal blood pressure should be around 120 over 80. Uh, so I called my doctor, they brought me in earlier and I looked at Paul and I was like, you know, Paul's my husband. I looked at Paul and I said, I think we should probably maybe pack our bags and have everything ready because I could walk into this appointment and immediately be sent to the hospital and be induced. I, my entire pregnancy, I had the feeling that Henry was going to come early and uh, it turns out I was right. Um, so went to the doctor's appointment, my blood pressure 
was initially 164 over 100, which is again high. Anytime that bottom number goes over 100, it's a concern. They let me wait it out while I did the non-stress test. They came back, took it again, and it was even higher. My doctor walked in and I knew exactly what was going to happen. But as soon as she said the words, you know, we're sending you to the hospital to be, uh, to be monitored, I lost it. <laughs> um, so I went to the hospital and because we were still very heavily into COVID times, I had to go into the labor and delivery triage by myself. Uh, Paul had to stay out in the waiting room. I had to go in by myself. I don't like doctors either. So <laughs> so this was a really fabulous experience oh, that you would 10 out of 10 so recommend, right? 100%. <laughs> and then of course, like the, just the fear of like, oh my gosh, I might be having a baby today, which I've, I've never done before. So I went into labor and triage, uh, labor triage. They hooked me up to the blood pressure monitor. My blood pressure was even higher than it had been at my doctor's appointment. Obviously I was very stressed, so... <laughs> They just kept monitoring. And once they got my test results back, they discovered that I did have trace amounts of protein in my urine. So I was diagnosed with preeclampsia, but I was completely asymptomatic. I had zero symptoms. Um, I know you had symptoms of it. I sure did. No headaches. <laughs> I had only just starting, started swelling up my pregnancy, but I went in to the hospital at 37 weeks. So it was like kind of somewhat normal at that point to yeah. start swelling so yeah and then that was the fun moment where they came in and told me uh we're gonna put you on magnesium sulfate yeah. and instant <laughs> panic because I knew from Erica's experience that that's not really a fun uh medication to be on so I literally looked at them and I was like please please is there anything else that you can give me except for <laughs> my sulfate like please um and they're like no, like this is a matter of your life and your baby's life. You have to take, you have to be on this medication. So they started trying to do the IV. And first off, I have an extreme phobia of needles, like not even a fear, not a dislike, like a phobia. So alone in the hospital room, knowing I'm going to be induced that day, I'm, I'm like, what the, what is going on? <laughs> Being about to be put on a medication that I know is not a fun ride. It was a lot. And the medication, the mag sulfate, it hits you like instantly. Oh yeah. Instantly. I mean, not to interrupt you, but to, to give some sort of perspective here, if you don't already know my story, which I guess you will in a hot second anyway. Um, but one of my best friends who underwent chemo at age 15 said, and who has also been on magnesium sulfate said that mag sulf is the closest thing she has ever experienced to having chemotherapy. So it is not exactly something you jump up and down to receive. Yeah, no. Um, instantly, it they basically told me, like, you're just going to feel, you might feel, like, really hot. You'll feel, like, kind of heavy. Um, like, not totally, like, you'll, your mind will be foggy. And it's 100% um, how it felt. Uh, I've heard it said that it's kind of, like, coming out of anesthesia, where you're, like, kind of there, but you're kind of not. It's not fun. Do not recommend. Um, but obviously it is a very, it's a life-saving drug. So <laughs> there's a reason you may be on it. After that, Paul was allowed into the maternity ward because I was admitted. And because of COVID, once we were admitted, we were not allowed to leave our room. We couldn't leave for water. We couldn't leave to walk around. We were stuck in our room until the baby came, which was two days later. Um <laughs> I was induced. They started off with the normal cocktail of induction medication. I was given Cervidil, um, and then after that, Pitocin, um, which they just steadily increased. I was having issues where when I would get up to use the bathroom, I would have moments where my blood pressure would skyrocket and then plummet. So eventually I was not allowed to move out of my bed. Um, I was uh, given a catheter, which was super fun. Oh, God. Honestly, it really wasn't <laughs> Loving flashbacks. Because <laughs> they had done, I also had a Foley balloon. Oh, God. The catheter was like nothing compared to that. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so then I was bedridden, could not move. I labored for 48 hours. And that's the whole thing with magnesium sulfate that they also don't tell you is that it's a muscle relaxer. Everything that I had in my body was just fighting each other. So labor was just 
moving so, so, so slow. Um, but my doctors were confident. They were like, we want you to have as natural of a labor as, and delivery as you want. So there's no reason to move to a C-section unless you or the baby are in dire need of it. So yeah, I'm moving for 48 hours. Um, I got my epidural around, I want to say I gave birth. I was admitted on a Tuesday, gave birth on Thursday afternoon. I got my epidural, I think Wednesday night. Again, with a max sulfate, like you, everything's blurry. You don't even know what day it is. You don't even know what year it is. You forget um, your name sometimes. So I went ahead to get my epidural. They came in and the nurse, the anesthesiologist nurse took one look at my back and was like, oh, what is that on your back? I had surgery when I was three months old because I had um, tether cord syndrome. So I needed surgery when I was little. So that scar was there. And she looks at it. I told her, explained it to her. She goes, oh. And leaves the room. And I'm like, <laughs> not a good move, girlfriend. <laughs> so eventually she comes back in and um, she says, this might not work. Hmm. And I was like, pardon? <laughs> what do you mean? She goes, well, you might have a buildup of scar tissue that might block the epidural from moving past your hips. And I'm like, well, that's, that's the whole point. The whole point. That's the whole point. You don't need numb toes. You really <laughs> just need a num- numb hoo-ha. Mm-hmm. So I was like, just do it. Like, whatever. We'll see. If it works, it works. That's great. If not, it doesn't. She, so she, we did the process. Epidural did not hurt me. The IV hurt more than the epidural. <laughs> and I was very afraid of getting the epidural. So after the epidural, they laid me down, laid me on my right side. My legs started to go numb which was a very strange feeling is was not like pins and needles for me. Like I would touch my legs and it was like, they were not there, <laughs> which for a control freak like me, it was I my legs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't run if I need to. So I laid down, I was going to get some rest and there was a nurse still in the room and I was turned facing my monitors. Um, so like the heart rate monitors, the contraction monitor, the monitor for Henry's heart rate, blood pressure, pulls off, all of that fun stuff. And Paul was sitting on the couch and all of a sudden, um, things start beeping. And my nurse like panics. And next thing I know, I open my eyes, I'm on my back. And there's like a team of doctors and nurses all standing over me, talking, giving orders, doing all this stuff. Like, and I was like, hello. <laughs> like, Hi everyone. <laughs> hello. But like, Welcome happened? to my birth. And it was a very strange experience. The best way I can explain it is that it was exactly like you might see on like Grey's Anatomy or like one of those hospital shows. Um, It was very bizarre. Uh, At the time, I had no idea what was going on. Um, Turns out I was dying. Um, (laughs) Super fun. For some reason, the epidural just did not react well with my body and started making my blood pressure just plummet. Paul, my husband said that the numbers on the screen said my blood pressure was 40 over 10. <laughs> so I should have been dead. Yeah. But um, you're not really alive at that point. Like in that moment, I was, I was actually crashing and yeah, it was very much like a scene out of a hospital. It's the best way to explain it. I don't know if it was because I was hovering between life and death that it was, it felt the way that it did or because of the magnesium sulfate, but it was a very out of body experience. And it was just like people explain, like, I just wanted to sleep. I just wanted to close my eyes and go to sleep. I was like, go away. Like, I'm tired. I just want to sleep. <laughs> and I like closed my eyes at one point. My nurse was like trying to talk to me, keep me awake. And when I opened my eyes back up again, there were more doctors. Um, and this prayer is really hard. Um, I could see Paul standing behind everyone just looking at me in absolute terror and fear and again it was like like the shows where he was just pushed to the back and he had no idea what was going on he was completely helpless um as he watched me and his child potentially die obviously we're here but it was a very very strange experience I just like I said I just wanted to sleep and I closed my eyes and I was just so at peace and it was like 
little voice popped into my head and was like, you need to keep your eyes open. You cannot go to sleep. If you, if you go to sleep right now, it's, it's done. And it was at that point where I was, I started fighting it and fighting to stay awake and attentive. They were able to stabilize my blood pressure. It dropped again. So there's another scary moment, but they were able to stabilize it. And like, in that moment, I, I still like didn't realize what happened until after I gave birth. So got to sleep after that. <laughs> and it was so, there was a funny moment where they like readjusted all my monitors and wires and everything. The pull socks that they put in your finger, they put it on the same arm as my blood pressure cuff. So at one point, I'm finally trying to fall back to sleep after everybody's left my room and is like not watching me like a hawk. And all I hear, Paul goes, babe. I'm like, what? He goes, are you alive? (laughs) I'm talking to you. (laughs) Yes, and I'm trying to sleep. And because the pulse ox was on the same arm as my blood pressure cuff and the blood pressure monitor was blowing, like expanding, it was cutting off the circulation to my foot, uh, my fingers. So it was showing on the monitor that I was not alive, (laughs) that I had the vitals. So they very quickly fixed that. So it was just waiting after that. Everything was fine. Next day, suddenly I was at 10 centimeters. Like, okay, we're going to have a baby. And I was like, okay, we're going to have a baby. Like, let's do this. And started the process of pushing, which as a, a first time mom, you know, you have to practice and it can take a while, uh, especially again, because the mix- the magnesium sulfate is a muscle relaxer. So your body is not working at hundred um, percent, no matter how strong you are. I mean, magnesium sulfate makes it hard to keep your eyes open, yeah. let alone push a human really being out of your arm. body. Yes. It's, it's, so I can't even imagine them being like, yep, put now push, push a human you. being yeah. out of you. When I, I'd be like, all right, I think we got to wait till I'm this stuff's out of my system <laughs> yeah. because this isn't going to work y'all. <laughs> yeah, like, Science says, Yeah. If I can't open my eyes, I'm not going to be able to do anything that way. Mm-hmm. To the bathroom on my own. How am I supposed to push a human out of me? Um, well, I did it. <laughs> so, a uh, pat on the back to me, but yeah, so started pushing, trying to get Henry out. That was when I realized um, my epidural is not working because I felt everything mm-hmm. and eventually got to the point where they were like, okay, we, we need to take a break here. We need to discuss moving forward and what our options are, which was either we can go for a C-section right now because Henry was starting to show signs of stress and his heart rate was dropping with each contraction, or we can try an assisted birth. Uh, so with magnesium sulfate, again, like I was not of the right mind to make any kind of decision. So I looked at Paul and I was like, whoa, what, what, like, what should we do? And he was like, let's try the vacuum <laughs> and we'll see how that goes. And if it doesn't work out, then we'll just go to the OR for C-section. So Henry was a vacuum assisted birth. Uh, don't Google it. You won't enjoy it. It was vacuum assisted, which immediately called in the NICU team for that because there are a lot of risks and complications that can occur with a vacuum uh, birth. So they were there to assess um, to make sure he didn't come out with any head injuries or uh, lacerations or anything like that. Uh, Vacuum worked. Henry was sunny side up. So... (laughs) That's why I was having such a difficult time because normally a baby's head, they are, they come face down and they're kind of like able to like dolphin dive <laughs> up into the world. Yeah. Not Henry. Nope. Uh, so I would not have been able to expel him from my body without either a C-section or back in the birth. When he came out, he had the most, what we thought at the time was the most pathetic, adorable little mewing cries. Turns out that was not normal. The cord had been wrapped around his neck twice. So that's part of the reason why he had appeared to be in distress. Um, And then on top of that, the magnesium sulfate transfers through the placenta to the baby, um, which I was not aware of. Part of his crying was for that reason. Um, And then he had incredibly low muscle tone. He was a floppy little pancake. (laughs) Like 
maybe pancake's not the right word, but he was super floppy. Normally when you hold up the babies, even a newborn's arms, there is some sort of give, some sort of um, them pulling the weight of their arms. Henry just flopped to the side. Um, so he had incredibly low muscle tone. After reading his discharge papers, um, they had to stimulate him several times uh, while he was in the room because he had stopped breathing. They had given him oxygen and then eventually they took him to the NICU. I was able to hold him for maybe a minute. Uh, Paul got to hold him for maybe 30 seconds before they packed him in his little isolate and wheeled him off. So yeah, that was, that was the birth, um, felt everything. And then after that, I just remember scrubbing down three meals because I hadn't eaten in two days and Paul couldn't leave the room when he got his meals. So it was pure torture. And then we were told that Henry would be in the NICU just overnight, just for some monitoring, making sure that he was breathing okay on his own. I knew both my brother and I had been in the NICU. So I knew I was like, okay, he's in the best hands possible. Like, it's fine. You're still on the magnesium sulfate for 24 hours after you give birth. So you're still super, super out of it. You are in no way, shape or form like able to care for a newborn anyway. <laughs> so it was a uh, kind of a blessing. I wanted just passing out the rest of the night. I couldn't even make it to the NICU to go see him, but Paul did go um, to see him. Uh, next day, I went down to the NICU in the morning. They wheeled me down to go see Henry and uh, they wouldn't let me hold him because they said I was too weak from the magnesium sulfate and they couldn't safely put him in my arms. So I turned around and went back to my room, which is really hard. You don't want to be told that you can't hold your newborn baby. Not fun, especially when what you're hoping for is that golden hour of skin to skin and like starting to breastfeed as soon as possible. Nope. I was able to go see him later that night after they took me off the magnesium sulfate and started to leave my body. And I was like, okay, like when can he come back to the room? like and be with me well he his muscle tone's still really low they had him on an IV at that time because he was not interested in eating at all because again the magnesium sulfate is a muscle relaxer and that was still working through his body so think of everything in your body that is a muscle his body was just not wanting to work he was healthy otherwise but was not interested in eating. So then he was not interested in, not interested. And then he couldn't poop. <laughs> so then his bilirubin levels were going high. So then he had jaundice. Paul and I were discharged that Saturday. So two days after I had Henry and we did not go home with him. After that, it was kind of a day by day, like, can he come home today? No, sorry, his levels are still too high. Can he come home today? No, he didn't poop enough. Can he come home today? No, he um, he didn't eat enough today. Henry was in the NICU for a week, mostly because of the jaundice levels. And they kept getting higher. They were still like, he wasn't, he wasn't sick. They would have been safe enough to come home. They probably would have never known that his levels were where they were at if he hadn't been in the NICU. And then <laughs> my favorite part, we were kind of like at the point, uh, because again with COVID, we were restricted with how much we could visit him and for how long. So at first he was in a private room so we could go see him during the normal NICU hours, but we weren't allowed to leave the hospital. We left the hospital, couldn't come back. Then when he was moved to the open air room, he we had a three hour time span that had to be like scheduled for when we could come and visit him. And that was it. Eventually, I got to the point where I was like, okay, like this is enough. He was under super intensive phototherapy lights to the point where they wouldn't even let him out of the isolate. Uh, so they were even giving him his bottles in the isolate, not taking them out. So we would go and visit him and we would be able to hold him for maybe five minutes tops if they would even let us hold him that day, which was really hard, really, really hard. You know what that's like. Oh, I think one of the hardest things about NICU life is the rules mm -hmm. that are placed upon new parents. And as, especially if it's your first time being a parent, you're already kind of going into it, probably a little bit nervous, confused, mm -hmm. wondering, okay, am I, am I going to be a good mom? Am I going to be a good dad? Like, 
going to figure it all out. And then here you have, you know, they're in good hands in the NICU, but then you also have these people who are telling you like, you can't hold your baby right now. You, oh, I'm going to give them a bath or I'm going to do X, Y, Z and you can watch. And I think automatically you're fighting these subconscious thoughts of, oh, is it because I'm, they know, they know I'm not going to be a good parent. Like it's because I'm not worthy of having this child with me right now because I'm going to mess it up if it's Mm -hmm. so you're already going through such hormonal shifts and then you've been through trauma and now you're not with your baby. And then the last thing you want is for a stranger, even though they're totally equipped, like NICU nurses are some of the best people in the world. They're totally the people who are literally saving your baby's life. But it's just like, not the time where you want to hear like, no, sorry, you don't get to hold your baby today. And you're like, sorry, you want to breastfeed. You can't do that. Yeah, you can't. Mm -mm. You can go pump in the corner. Oh, I distinctly remember one day when we went into the NICU and the the nurse was holding Liv and Jamie went to go take Liv from the nurse and she literally pulled back and goes, wash your hands first. Yep. Mm-hmm. And we were like, like, yeah, obviously. But we were, we were so taken aback because we were like, I'm, excuse me, what? This is our baby that you are holding. We don't even know your name. Mm-hmm. Of course we'll wash our hands, but like, just the whole, the whole dynamic of the situation was it's very hard. hard because your instinct is to hold your baby and take care of your baby. And you should be the one taking care of your baby. And the nurses on their side are, I'm doing everything to keep this baby alive and well. And it's very, it's a very hard line to toe. So yeah, could barely hold Henry. COVID restrictions, limiting our visits. And then ugh, distinctly like I have trauma just from this one experience um he was under the phototherapy lights they literally had him under like a department fluorescent light like that's how big it was and then he was also wrapped in a phototherapy blanket so he just looks like a little glow worm he's stripped down to the diaper he's got the little like sunglass eye thing the goggles the ski goggles all babies hate and he started crying and retching and screaming and thrashing and his, like, his isolate is, like, locked. I don't know how to open it other than the armholes. So I'm trying to console him. There are no nurses around. There's other parents, like, looking at us. I'm, like, everyone thinks I'm a bad mom. Like, I can't console my child. Like, he's screaming. But I'm, like, everything in my body is, like, you need to hold him. You need to pick him up. And I, I can't. And he is screaming so hard that he is shaking his isolate. And there was nothing I could do. And that was so defeating to know that you couldn't even like comfort your own child um and then my favorite part of the whole NICU journey is I was on antidepressants during my pregnancy I was told that it was completely safe totally fine no you can continue I was like okay cool great and then the doctor had made her rounds the one day and called me to give me an update And she said, so I see that you were taking antidepressants during your pregnancy. I'm like, yeah, like the doctor said it was fine. She's like, well, um, Henry has been very irritable. (laughs) And, uh, you know, he's just not very happy. So we think he's experiencing withdrawal. And I was like, what? She goes, yeah. Um, So we have a a person from social services. And I'm like, oh my God, they're going to take my baby away because I was on medication to make me happy. (laughs) And I was just like, what? Like, like, what do you mean? He's going through withdrawal. I remember you texting me about this and we were, I was like, excuse me, what? (laughs) Repeat what you just said. So they told me then that they had to hold him another 24 hours because they had to do a full assessment to see if he was still showing withdrawal symptoms and to contact social services and I was just like, so when we got into the NICU, I pulled the nurse. I was like, were you the nurse attending who said you think he's going through withdrawal? She was like, yes, well, he's very irritable and he's crying and he's shaking and he's clenching his fist. And I'm like, do you see him in the isolate under all of these lights, naked with a thing over his eyes, not being able to be helped? Would you not also be angry? And she was like, well, and I was like, I'm not a nurse. I don't know how to do your job, but like, this just this seems doesn't like a this seems like a application for common common sense. Yeah. So <laughs> he was released the next day after we called a pediatrician to help advocate for us because it was also the struggle of you as a parent or anything. I don't think people realize how much advocacy you have for yourself mm-hmm. 
in the medical realm. You can literally turn down anything. You could have, with a baby in the NICU, you could say, you know what, I'm taking this baby home and you can't stop me. <laughs> there could be complications from that, mm -hmm. um, but you can do that. So there were moments where we're like, scientifically, medically, like he's safe to come home. Like his uh, jaundice levels were within a range that were technically considered safe and normal for his weight and his age. But it was also then you played the factor of, well, if I bring him home, what if he gets sick? Or what if he has to go back to the hospital? Then I look like a bad parent. So it was just a struggle. We brought Henry home. First night was awful. <laughs> he screamed the entire night. And again, it was just the culmination of not having my baby home for a whole week and being like, I don't know how to be his mom. He doesn't know me as his mom. That's why he's screaming at me. That's why he's so calm with the nurses, but screams when I'm trying to hold him. Um, was not the case, obviously. He was just very gassy. Um, <laughs> is that the poop, poor guy? But yeah, that was, that was our, our birth. Yeah, on that note, how you doing now? I'm, I'm in a much better place than I was, so... We talked about this before hitting record. Like there's a big caveat to thriving after trauma because we were laughing about the title of this episode and just how, you know, neither one of us could really say, yes, 100%, I am thriving after birth trauma. But we said the caveat here for people that we hope you, that we hope comes across is that thriving is a journey. And we both kind of agreed on, defining it as this intentional, more of an intentional process than a final destination. And because we have both very proactively and intentionally gone to therapy and really pursued getting to a place of healing, that is what we were like, you know what, dang it, we are now, we're thriving after birth trauma in that sense, in that we are not just letting ourselves or our families be defined by the, the, undeniably traumatic events that we experienced, but we are trying to do something productive with it for ourselves so that we are not just in this constant place of being triggered or in a constant place of PTSD or fear or sadness or whatever other completely not fun emotion <laughs> ends up coming up. Um, but it's still hard because like you got emotional recounting it now and it's been a year and a half. I was in therapy a couple months ago, sobbing my eyes out and it's been three and a half years. I tried in therapy last night. Yes. So like, it's still, even, I think even once you get to a place of healing, it can still be something that is emotional and is still hard and still brings up things. I think it's something where you heal, but that, you know, it's people will say like time heals all wounds. And I believe that to a point, I think instead of like, you don't get, you know what, scratch that. You don't get over it. Yeah. You learn, you grow around it and you le le learn to live around it. And it's always going to be something that is part of your life and will come up at sometimes the most random moments. Um, like when I was at the dentist office. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what about the dentist office? Oh no, I, um, when I went to the dentist to get a cavity filled and they gave me the Novocaine, for some mm -hmm. reason, I was instantly triggered, went back, literally had a flashback to when I was getting my epidural and like almost died. And I was at, like having a panic attack in the dentist office. Who would think that getting numb to get a cavity filled would trigger my birth trauma? Like, wild. Um, but it's always going to be with you and that's not a negative thing. And I think it's also important to know, I think we were able to heal in the time frame that we were able to because we'd already been in therapy. <laughs> and I think we're both people who are very self-aware of our emotions and how they affect us. But it's also, you know, healing is not linear. Mm -hmm. There's no set timeline. There's no set time frame. You're going to have ups. You're going to have downs. You're going to be all over the place. But you just start to learn to process and to grow around your trauma and not let it define you. I think sometimes too, when you go through something traumatic, like, and we had the same sort of experience in this sense, you don't, you're not necessarily, especially since this was our first time giving birth respectively, we weren't necessarily sitting there going, oh no, like this is, this is trauma. This is going to define my yeah. story. Like 
we said it would have probably been a little bit different for each of us if we had had a kid already that had this like glorious quote and quote, perfect birth experience, because at some point it, we would have had the thought like, oh no, things are going horribly wrong. But we both had to have our moms say to us during our processes, like, Hey, this is not normal. Yeah. Like this is not how birth typically goes. Mm -hmm. And while every birth experience is different, we, we both almost died. Like my blood pressure at its highest, I believe was 181 over 122 mm -hmm. and anything over 180 over 120 is considered hypertensive stroke. Yeah. So I'm really surprised you did not have a stroke. <laughs> oh, that's what, so I think I already had shared, I think I shared my birth, my, my birth story on thrive before I definitely shared it on the blog. I'll keep it real short and sweet right now, just to give some high points here for perspective. But, um, I was diagnosed with severe preeclampsia around what, I guess 30 ish weeks. And so Liv was eight weeks premature. She ended up being born via emergency C-section at 32 weeks, six days. And on the day she was born, I had gone at this point, I had been going in for maybe a week and a half at that point for routine checks at maternal fetal medicine. And they were monitoring me very closely. They already knew it was going to be a premature birth, given the fact that my placenta was very steadily failing. Um, but they were trying to get me basically as long as possible for safe delivery. And on the day that she ended up being born, I had gone in and I had an ultrasound and then they, the tech left, which when they leave without saying anything, it's not typically great news. So I wish they would kind of give you some sort of something to yeah. work with. I don't know if it's, maybe it's worse if they're like, Hey, just so you know, no, everything's like, about to go very poorly. They can't say <laughs> yeah. They can't say anything, but the problem is like, we know, yes. you know, when something is not right. So then it was, I think maybe 40 minutes later when a hospitalist came in and I'm just chilling there at this point. And he just sat me down and he was like, listen, you are much sicker than you feel. You are at a severe risk of a stroke, a seizure or both today. So we need to take the baby. And I was like, excuse me, Repite, por favor. <laughs> like, uh, huh? And mind you, at this point, Jamie had already left the hospital to go back to work because he thought this was just a routine checkup. We were thinking we were just getting our, making sure we're good to see another day. So he wasn't there with me anymore. This was, I mean, this was pre COVID of course, but, um, yeah, he, he had said, uh, if we wait, the hospitalist had said, if we wait, the baby might be okay, but you might not be. So at this point, like your life is in danger. We, we need, to, we need to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I was like, I said, <laughs> I think my exact words to him were, um, cool. Uh, can we, can we do this tomorrow? <laughs> And I, I, me being like a scheduler, I was like, can I just pencil this in? Like, can we just maybe like plan this for later? Not like right now, but like, let me just plan a little bit. Two to four open. Right. I have like two to four open tomorrow. Can that work? He, and he looked at me probably like I was crazy. He's like, no, no, no. You're not understanding. Like we need to deliver today. Like as soon as we can, as soon as an operating table opens, you are going in. I'm like, oh, okay. So I guess I'm having a C-section. That's like also what this means. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, I think it was around like 10 o'clock. And then I ended up giving birth at 2.34. So it was like a decently quick process. As soon as I had that conversation with them, they hooked me up to magnesium sulfate, which like you said, um, that's just hell. Uh, also had a catheter, also had all of all of the things. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, had emergency C-section. Liv was three pounds, 0.1 ounces did not get to hold her until the next day. Um, same sort of stuff in that, you know, when you are, you, you could barely function yourself on magnesium sulfate, let alone hold a human being. I mean, they, they shouldn't have let me hold her. That was, that was a smart move, uh, but it still just so sucks looking back. Compared to like my almost nine pound babies. Henry was a <laughs> chunker. God bless. Yeah. So, um, really bizarre. And then she was in the NICU for 73 days. Mm -hmm. So that I feel like we had birth trauma and then we also had NICU trauma because right. there's just so much to unpack with all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I know you had something you wanted to mention on this, just the narrative around birth in general and how, because while every, we had similarities in our traumas and in our experiences and in what we went through as ourselves with our preeclampsia too, but every single birth experience is so, so different. And it can be really 
alarming, especially with how social media is nowadays, when you do start to consciously become self-aware of what you are personally experiencing, if it's not like what you expected, if it's not like what you see on your Instagram feed or what you have had girlfriends go through, because you're just like, besides the very, right. And like, besides the very real fear and reality that you may be, you might be dying. Your baby might be dying. Like there's actual very high risk things happening. You're also like, it's still hard for women. If like they're, they go off birth plan or something like we were kind of laughing at that. And I don't want to invalidate right. people who like feel like that's traumatic for them because it's all very relative. I, I don't care how I labor as long as it comes out of my body healthy in yeah. one piece and I'm still here and the baby's still here. We're, we're, we're good. Not the same way it happened last time. Right. Like not the same way it happened before, which is such a unique situation to when you have been through something life-threatening because like you're I mean, everything changes. Yeah. It, uh, first, I want to touch on, because you had mentioned, you know, Henry was in the NICU for a week versus Olivia 73 days. So there's a lot to unpack in the fact that of like almost imposter syndrome and the toxic positivity around like, like, for example, for me, it was like, well, Henry was only in the NICU for a week. Like he could have been there for two and a half months like Olivia was, you know. Um, oh, no, but it's still hard. But Every day still, and then it keeps hard. It's still hard. Yeah. And so there's a lot to work through through with that. And not everyone's trauma is the same. What yeah. may be traumatic for me may not be traumatic for you. What may be traumatic for Erica may not be traumatic for me. Um, and there is no like set definition for what what defines trauma. There's only a definition on the symptoms you experience yeah. after it that can define whether you had trauma or not. Or the fact that you can just declare that you had trauma and that you had a traumatic birth and that's fine. And those feelings are a hundred percent valid birth in and of itself, whether it is, you know, when every single way that you had hoped it went, when textbook, te- the textbook, perfect is still traumatic. It is a very traumatic, traumatic to your body. Right. But there is just this narrative of that birth is blissful and it's, beautiful and it's perfect and it's just so amazing and it's you know it's just the most beautiful thing you could ever do even despite all the trauma and experiences that I had in my birth my birth was beautiful I don't regret it it was hard I'm at a place where I don't regret what happened there's nothing that I really could have done in that moment first off to have changed it most everything was completely out of my control but there is you know, and even the narrative like about newborn life and how blissful it is and it's just newborn cuddles and just sniffing your newborn and everything. And it might be like that for some people, but it's not like that for everyone. And I think we need to start acknowledging that and talk about it more and normalize it because promoting this super positive, like everything's amazing ideal is detrimental. It is it's not good for our mental health. Um, I mean, we talk about Instagram in general about how you shouldn't compare yourself to other people and what you see on Instagram or social media is a highlight reel of someone's life. You don't know what's going on behind closed doors. And it's almost similar with the way people talk about labor and delivery and the after of having a newborn and everything. Yeah. Well, this also brings up a good point because I also don't want to a bash or make people feel bad for having good birth experiences, because this is what's so strange. I think when people have experienced trauma, a, we both didn't necessarily, like we said, we didn't realize what it was until after and in the healing process. And sometimes you don't even realize what about it was so traumatic until you're going through and really unpacking it because it might've hit you for a different reason, or it was some sort of other internal belief that you had, like for me, so much was around a fear that I wasn't going to be a good mom. Mm -hmm. And every day in the NICU was reinforcing that. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah, it's actually, she's still here because you're not, you're not a good mom. You're not going to be a good mom. You're not, you you don't deserve to bring her home today. None of that was true, but like, dude, couple that with postpartum hormones. And like, Mm -hmm. you'll believe that the sky's purple. Like it really can mess you up. But then, um, we were talking about this before we started recording too. It can be really hard because other people's triggers are not your responsibility. So we both really took it upon ourselves to intentionally pursue healing because we didn't want to walk around like an eggshell where anything that anybody said 
was hurting us or making us lash out or making them feel like they were in the wrong or at fault because they did not have something traumatic happen to them. Like, no, oh my goodness. We don't want any trauma to happen to anybody. Like good heavens have the most amazing experience ever, but it's something that when anyone has, who has experienced trauma of any sort, I think ends up in this position of being like, oh man, you kind of have, you're like confronted with the need to do something to help yourself Mm -hmm. because you don't want it to become something where you're now, everyone's on eggshells around you or doesn't necessarily know how to comfort you or talk to you or relate to you because it's like such a touchy situation. And we've both seen it where we've had people in our lives who had something happen. And instead of being like, you know what, this happened to me, I own it. I'm not responsible for it, but I am responsible for what comes next in my life and what I do with it. They just took it as, oh my gosh, I, something happened to me. Everybody else is triggering me. Everyone else has to know that I've been through this hard thing and everyone needs to be, touch me with kid gloves because I am, I am triggered. (laughs) And we were like, it's, yeah, you have to do something Mm -hmm. to at some point move yourself forward so that you are not, so that everyone else around you isn't being held captive by that. And so that you are not being held captive by that. You don't want to live in that victim mindset. It is not good for you. And it's not good for your relationships. It's like we were saying before, you know, it, it's, you can experience like grief and joy at, at the same time. Oh yeah. They that's a good one. are, you don't have to just be grieving. You don't just have to be happy. You can feel both. And I think I have learned that so hard after experiencing um, what I did. I have had a couple of friends who've had babies since I've had Henry and it's been moments where I, I'm so happy for them. I'm so happy that everyone's healthy and everything went fine. But at the same time, it's that morning of my own experiences that I thought I would have of having that skin to skin golden hour with Henry of being able to breastfeed. I don't even know what the golden hour is. What is it? Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> this is how <laughs> removed I was. From, I'm like, I, I literally, if I ever had another kid, I wouldn't know how to have a newborn because yeah. I missed the entire newborn phase yeah. in the hospital. And I'm like, I don't even know what it means. Like, <laughs> enlighten me. <laughs> the golden hour is like immediately after birth, provided there are no complications. Um, They encourage you to do skin to skin with your baby for at least an hour um, because it's like a good transfer of hormones and like all that good stuff. It's like good for the baby and good for you. And, um, you know, instead of like taking your baby away immediately. Um, (laughs) Can't relate. It's a goal. (laughs) And then like the big factor too with like my friends having had babies is getting to see them bring them home when they get to go home. Um, I, I have a picture of my phone. I've never shared it with anybody, but I like could not walk after I had Henry. I tore very badly. Um, I was in a lot of pain. Um, so well, a nine pound baby, that'll do it yeah. for you. <laughs> that can it. Yeah. I, uh, Paul would pull up to the hospital. He'd grab a wheelchair, sit me in the wheelchair, put the brakes on go park the car and come back. And the amount of families I got to watch walk out of the hospital with a baby on their lap in a car seat and get to put that car seat in their car and drive away. And they had these big smiles on their faces that it was like twisting the knife. Cause it was just, I don't know when I'm getting, I don't know when I get to have that moment. So, but yes, grief and joy, they can, they can live at the same time. You can experience them at the same time and it's okay. And I think also when you experience trauma, it's really hard not to just become very cynical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like Erica and I laugh and it's, it's a little bit of cynicism. Um, and it's hard not to live in that resentment, but to know that that person who was experiencing joy and the experience that you had hoped for yourself, they're not doing it to attack you. And I think that can be very hard when you are in that trauma zone of like survival and your body is trying to regulate itself. You're like, well, they're doing that to spite me. (laughs) No, they're they're not. Like they're allowed to experience their life and have their joy and be happy. And it's okay if like it triggers you, but don't put that on them. Yeah. It's not their responsibility to take care of your triggers or to step around your triggers. I think that's probably one of the biggest things you and I both have undergone in therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, And also clearly we recommend therapy. (laughs) (laughs) 
But it's, it's so true because that's, if you, the sign of a healed or healing person, I think is being able to take responsibility for mm-hmm. what is theirs to take responsibility for. Yeah. And that's, I think why I said there's a difference, like you can own it and own that it's your responsibility for what comes next. Right. And you can also at the same time be like, yeah, that sucked. And I wish I hadn't gone through it. Mm -hmm. But I also think like, I'm at, I think in my own personal journey, I'm in a place though where I can't imagine having a different birth experience. Obviously it's because I never have experienced it, but I also can't imagine Lim's birth going a different way because weirdly in this like weird, ironic way, knowing her little personality now as a three and a half year old. Mm -hmm it's so in line and like how she is as a little human being is in, is so weirdly cosmically divinely in line with everything that happened in her birth. Like even just the sense of, we made this joke at the time, like way before healing started happening about like, well, she was just really ready for the world. Like she was good to go, very strong sense of self and her literal first day of life, the lead neonatologist said, uh, oh, she's a feisty one. Mm -hmm. And we were like, what does that mean? At the time we're like, is that good? Is that bad? Oh, it's good because this girl's personality now just makes sense. Like everything that she went through at such a young age where I don't, I'm sure she doesn't remember it, whatever, but it just makes sense. And it's like, that's, that's her like to a T. And I like, I could just, I would never, she would never have been a baby who like sat there till full term, took a couple extra days, was calm. To, she was like, excuse me, I have a list of demands on my way out. Every, like, she was like, this is how this is going to go. Um, so that's that, but I want to hit on advice for, um, if, if people have girlfriends who've experienced trauma, family members, whatever, and maybe our advice on how to actually navigate that conversation, because that's something that you and I have both experienced being on the receiving end of it. And also with girlfriends who have had trauma where you're kind of like, you're not sure where someone is on their own healing journey. You're not sure where someone is in terms of where their headspace is. Are they still actively triggered by things? Are they experiencing PTSD? Like what, where, where are we here? So what's okay to ask. And you want, if you're assuming people's best of intentions, you want to help, you want to be there. You want to show up as a good friend, a good family member. You also don't want to say the wrong thing and accidentally hurt someone or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, you could go first here. Give us, give us the advice on how to do it and have that conversation in a way that can be productive. I think first and foremost, it's super important to be super open, be super open, be super, um, like forward can come off as a bad word, but to be super, uh, direct about what it is, your friend or family, whoever you're speaking to, uh, what they need and literally just like, how can I best serve you in this time? And I think that can be such a great question to ask. Obviously people are not always inclined to be like, well, I need help in this, this, and this area. Um, but it can be that, that just opener of like, hi, I'm here. I'm listening. What can I do for you? How can I help you? How can I be there for you? Like, but then it also, you know, it's, you don't want to be super like in their face, like, hi, I want to help you, like, show me what to do. It's a, can sometimes be a very awkward line. I know for me, and I think for Erica too, we're, we're both super open about our experiences. Obviously we are sitting here on a podcast telling <laughs> you all about it. Um, so people deal with things differently. Um, Some people may be super open about it, may be super willing to talk about what happened and how they can, how they need help or what they need in that moment. Other people are very closed off and might repress all of that. So it's just, it's kind of just got to put your feelers out there. I think leading with radical transparency in this field helps a lot. And being able to just say to someone, if you're unsure what to say, you can say that. You can say to someone, hey, I want to ask you X, Y, Z. I don't want it to come across wrong. I don't want it to, if, if you're not ready to talk about it, please tell me, I'll respect that. If you do want to talk about it, I'm all ears. Like, right. and just acknowledging the elephant in the room and being like, listen, I am thinking about X, Y, Z. I'm thinking about you. I care about you. Do you want to talk about it? Do you not? Like, yeah. and respecting whatever someone says, I think that can, in and of itself can go a long way because we've talked about this before, just you and I together, like 
I think people sometimes tiptoe now around asking us about future family planning because everyone assumes oh, people don't tiptoe around it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they did. Kind of. <laughs> well, I feel like maybe it's just because I've shared all of it, like on the, everyone's aware of ours because it's on the internet, but people tiptoe around, around it. Actually, ironically, the, on uh, my last OBGYN appointment was the first time someone asked me when's baby number two. And it was from my OB. I was like the irony of this, of all people. Your OB for Liz, yes. So like they knew. Granted, she also had preemies. So like, I think oh. she just thought we were like on that level and she didn't even think it would be an issue. Mm-hmm. God bless her. But um, she was the first person that ever asked me, mm-hmm. so are you going to have another? Cause I think everyone just assumed like, oh yeah, there ain't no way we're touching that with a 10 foot pole. Like, <laughs> but I, it, it's something that like, I kind of wished people did talk about it. Cause then it feels that it feels normal to talk about what's next. Right. Is there? So even if, it, even if there are no plans or even if it's hard for what's next, you still can have that conversation. Right. It almost makes it more awkward if you're aware that people are intentionally avoiding that conversation with you because you just want to be like, dude, like, even if it's hard, I can, I can get through it and talk about it. If you're at that place where you're able to do so. I think in that aspect, like Paul and I, right now, we are very comfortable. We're like, you know, we still got a lot to process and go through before we even think about possibly having another one. Plus Henry has pure second child energy. So I don't know what that would mean for another kid. Um, pray for me. For me, like Henry hitting that one year mark, that's when everybody started asking us, like, what are you having another kid? Okay, you know what? How about we change the wording of that and say, are you planning to have more kids? Mm -hmm. Even just changing your wording in that aspect makes it so less like in your face and like demanding that you have to have another kid. Right. It's like there's nothing wrong with having one kid. I mean, some people who experience birth trauma can no longer have any other children. And so just Changing that sensitivity manner and changing how you word questions yeah. can mean the whole difference between, I mean, I had people being like, oh, so when are you having another kid? It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I almost died. I don't think anyone, even if someone didn't experience birth trauma, you should never say to a woman, when are you having a child? Because you have no idea yeah, what they're no dealing idea. with from a fertility standpoint. <laughs> so that's just a question. That's all. Ixnay that one Yeah. right now. <laughs> no, again, with like changing the narrative around birth and labor and delivery and newborn stage and being a mother or a parent in general, I think we can all move forward as a society to a better place if we just kind of change the wording a little bit. Not saying that you can't ask those questions or you shouldn't ask those questions, just, but be mindful about how you're asking that question. Mm -hmm. Because just one word change can mean the whole difference between me being like, oh my God, I love it, to like being able to have an open conversation about, well, you know, we, we might just be one and done. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's get things wrapped up by um, discussing what the transition of the word thriving has meant for us, both what it kind of looked like when we were in the thick of everything versus what it maybe looked like in the midway of the healing process or when we maybe started really intentionally trying to start healing versus now and what we hope it'll look like down the road uh so in the beginning you're you're not you're not thriving at all there's zero thriving happening. like physically your body and your mind are literally in survival mode um I feel like I didn't feel the pain of like giving birth after the fact because my body was just running off adrenaline um and not allowing me to feel that pain because it needed to, to survive um so in those moments it was it was not thriving at all um I felt like I was drowning and uh it eventually evolved to constantly thinking about my birth and playing it back back and back and what would I what could I change what could I do what like like how like what did I do wrong and then I moved to you know thinking about it in the free range of time that I would have as a new mother um, to not crying every day uh, to eventually going back to therapy and realizing that there wasn't there wasn't something wrong with me but there was something wrong with what I had experienced and I needed help so that I wasn't just in a reactionary mode all the time um because I experienced extreme rage, extreme depressive episodes, extreme anxiety, 
on top of like the normal postpartum hormones and postpartum depression. What a good cocktail of feelings. I had so much fun. <laughs> I literally felt like I was losing my mind. And then like now, I mean, I've, I've been through therapy and there's been a lot that I've worked through. I found a lot of different res- uh, resources out there and finding like that kind of community and being able to validate my feelings to a point where I can go day to day and not think about it. I can go day to day knowing that, yeah, it sucked, but it made me so much more of an empathetic person and a stronger person. And my experience has made me a, a better parent all around. And uh, I'm going to get triggered a few random times here and there. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I think in the beginning, it, thriving was just surviving Yeah. the next day and getting up to, to see the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and gosh, for when we were in the NICU, thriving, I think, was just not giving up hope entirely, which absolutely happened on multiple occasions Mm -hmm. but being willing to still choose like to still being willing to let yourself still hope and let yourself still feel optimistic that today's the day even though it very well might not be and we had our hopes crushed I mean 73 times Mm -hmm. (laughs) um that I guess 72 times I don't I don't know how that math works um I think that was thriving then. And then when you're in the newborn mode, I mean, Liv also had a feeding tube for six months after coming home. So we were home, but it still was not home home. We still had that reminder constantly of what happened and the hospital and just everything. And the constant reminder that this is not normal and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, I honestly don't even remember what thriving was then because I think I was just sleeping so little. I have little memories <laughs> of, of all of it. Well, especially when you are experiencing trauma, there's like an actual disconnect between your body yeah. and like your neurological system. Yeah, you actually, panic. yes, it's, it actually does, psych, I actually learned that through therapy. You, it psychologically becomes much more difficult to actually maintain memories. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually learned that my first time through therapy dealing with bullying from middle school years Mm -hmm. where I had to go to my parents and be like, can you describe to me what actually happened? Because I literally, I blacked, I blacked out. I don't, I couldn't tell you. Um, and that that's a trauma response, my friends. Uh, (laughs) so yeah, thriving then, but then, um, I think the, I don't want to say the older I get, cause it's not, it's been three years, but with really each passing day or each passing phase of being a mom, I think thriving has just been continuously redefined in the choices that I make to rise above it and go through it. And the, the choice to go to therapy was very much a decision trying, trying again, that journey towards thriving because it was refusing to be held victim in my own story and then wanting it to be something that could be helpful to other people maybe, but most importantly, helpful to me and my own family and my kids story. And I didn't want to be a mom that was constantly upset or triggered or not able to be there fully for my friends or for people experiencing other things or for any future kids that we might have. Like I wanted to be something where I was like, you know what? Yeah. This really shitty thing happened. And do I wish it would have gone differently? I mean, I don't really know anyone who would opt into it. Um, but it happened. So now what do we do with it? Because that's really, that's kind of the only choice you have left to make. And I think anyone who's willing to get up another day and stand back up and go forward intentionally going, you know what it happened now, now what? I think that is a very much a position set towards thriving again. But again, it's not, there are people who 20 years later are just acknowledging their birth trauma. There's actually statistics say one in three women report that their birth is traumatic, which is like insane if you think one in three women. Um, so there's, again, healing is not linear. There's, you take the time that you need. It's not, you just get up one day and suddenly you're better. Like it takes time and it takes, it takes effort <laughs> to oh, acknowledge yeah. that. And work through it to get to a place of thriving. I mean, it's a lot easier to ignore an elephant in a room than it is to coax the elephant out of oh, the yeah. room. It would be so, much so... if I could just repress all this and never. <laughs> but guess what? It's going to come back and bite me. Exactly. Sometime down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have? We have. Do we have anything else we want to bestow? I think just want to touch on the fact that 
birth trauma does not just happen to you. Oh yeah. Whoever you have in the room with you, your partner or whoever is your support person in that, it's also happening to them. And I think it's worth acknowledging that, that they, they should also seek help (laughs) and to acknowledge that the experience didn't necessarily just happen to you. Yeah. Not to belittle it in any way, but to also acknowledge the fact that somebody else went through it with you and they have their own experience and it can help you feel less alone Absolutely. when you think of it like that too, because it can feel so isolating when it's just you physically experiencing all of this, yeah. but at least from an emotional standpoint of what you are experiencing as a person and what your child is experiencing, knowing that someone else who cares just as deeply about you both also went through a very emotional roller coaster, I think can be very weirdly comforting. <laughs> it's easy to forget. Yeah, we're so for sure. of ourselves in that moment, in that trauma to forget that there are people outside of us who, who went through it as well. Yeah. Well, on that, I know this was a bit of a longer episode, so I think we just really hope that it touches and helps any of you who might have been through a traumatic birth yourself, or if you have a loved one who has gone through it or who might in the future go through it. We hope this episode just really kind of can be a blessing that gives you resources, ideas, thoughts, validation that you might not have had otherwise. And of course, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, wants us, want just someone a listening ear for your own uh, birth story or anything like that, please feel free to reach out to us. Team CUR or Team Thrive here is more than happy to be a shoulder for you to lean on through it because we know it can be the most, yeah, so isolating and just so freaking hard. So you don't have to do it completely alone. We're here for you. If if nothing else, then <laughs> through, um, through your headphones or through a computer screen. Um, and we're there for you to help you thrive through it. Wait, before you go, make sure you're subscribed to never miss an episode of Thrive. Drop five stars on your way out if you like what you just listened to. And come join the party on Instagram at thrive.podcast to stay inspired and thriving all week long. Thanks for tuning in. It's your time to thrive.